Hello, everyone. If I could uh, grab everyone's attention. My only role is to stop the, uh, <laughs> the socializing so we can enjoy this great event. Um, we are here today uh, for really a very happy and enjoyable reason, and that is to uh, uh, to celebrate the recognition of one of our very own faculty as uh, uh, as he takes his inaugural lecture as the uh, Sally Ann uh, Simenko Endowed Chair in our School of Law. And, uh, you know, it's worth just reminding everybody that in a university which is driven by the creativity and activity of our faculty, we have certain points where we uh, acknowledge certain key milestones. And one of certainly the most prestigious is uh, being recognized with an endowed chair. Um, it's something that, uh, David, your peers took very seriously when they considered you, uh, but I have a funny feeling it wasn't a hard decision for them to recognize you for your work, and it's basically a way in which we recognize those that stand out from that group and uh, whose scholarship and contributions kind of transcend even the remarkable work we expect from all other faculty. And so, David, we think this is very appropriate, and, um, and we're very happy for you. I think probably a lot of you know this, but uh, uh, let me just reiterate for the few uh, who may not, David is being recognized for a lot of things. You'll hear uh, a more fulsome introduction momentarily, but you know his research is very visible. It's often in the news uh, on law enforcement and criminal justice and racial profiling and it's work that has had great impact shaping uh, uh, legislation and, and really a national discourse on these issues. Um, he's also being recognized for his efforts to educate law enforcement and the public on these issues and his dedication to training the next generation of legal scholars and professionals in this area. So it's really the whole package. Uh, David's work has garnered many awards including the Jefferson Award for Outstanding Public Service from the Jefferson Awards Foundation, and also the Western District of Pennsylvania's U.S. Attorney's Award for Service. And uh, of course, with his endowed chair, David will continue to take on these roles. Um, and uh, we will leverage uh, your reputation, David, to help attract additional talent uh, to the region. Um, it is our custom in the Academy to recognize moments like this uh, just to prove the old adage, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, David, we will ask you to come up and we will publicly hang you <laughs> with a medallion. And I've warned him we will put it on long enough to take a picture and then I've urged him to take it off because the uh, Velcro has about a 10 minute lifetime. <laughs> and then he has to work for his award by giving us uh, an inaugural lecture, which we will all enjoy momentarily. So, just like the Olympics. You remember, you remember that, right? I know the song. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, I'll give it back. There we go. <laughs> Amy, it's all yours. All right, thank you again to Chancellor Gallagher, Provost Cudd, and all of you for being here today for this very special event to honor renowned legal scholar and educator, David A. Harris. We are especially pleased to have the opportunity to recognize and celebrate Professor Harris with this most fitting honor, the Sally Ann Semenko Endowed Chair a product of the extraordinary generosity of Christopher Walthour, one of our law alums. Gifts like this from our alum and supporter community allow us to provide much needed support for our incredibly talented faculty, and we are deeply grateful for them. Yesterday I learned a new acronym for a phenomenon that is typically used to describe what I think of as the very best of scholarly efforts. FOMO, or fear of missing out. The expression, as I understand it, it describes those who see something new on the horizon and jump in, all in, to sort it out and to become an influencer in that new thing. For many years, 
Professor Harris has jumped in, all in, on the cutting edge. If you wanted to learn what was new and hip, even long before the internet made it easy, you read Professor Harris's work. More than 20 years ago, Professor Harris began his path-breaking work on racial profiling that became the basis for the Federal Traffic Stops Statistics Act of 1997 and for many other federal and state legislative actions in the years since. From this work, he saw the importance of understanding implicit bias and has now, for many years, provided training on implicit bias for places like, I don't know, the White House and numerous prosecutor offices, public defender agencies, police departments, and non-governmental organizations. And in 2010, he wrote the first piece of legal scholarship on body, police body cameras. <laughs> Professor Harris is not just ahead of the curve, he's out in front of it. With his impressive list of articles and three books on police, public safety, and the law, Profiles and Justice, well, racial why racial profiling? Sorry, we, we gotta get this down. I, I must have put my paper on the wrong thing. He's, we're gonna try, anybody need any help with the search? <laughs> Davis. Oh, okay. All right, Profiles and Injustice. Well, ra why racial profiling cannot work in 2002. Good Cops, the case for preventing policing in two thousand for preventive policing in 2005, and failed evidence why law enforcement resists science in 2012. It was no surprise that Professor Harris was recently named the 20th most cited scholar in criminal law and procedure in the nation. This is truly a remarkable accomplishment that puts Professor Harris in the most distinguished of company. But it does not end with his scholarship. Professor Harris works regularly with community groups, police departments, prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, and bar associations. He provides training, research-based information, and practical suggestions, all aimed at promoting better relations between law enforcement and communities, understanding and improvement of the law, and increasing public safety. Most recently, he has been deeply engaged locally in efforts to address community and police relations after the shooting death of Antoine Rose. For his efforts, Professor Harris is a winner of the Jefferson Award for Public Service, which recognizes his national and local work bringing together law enforcement and the communities they serve in order to build mutual trust, <coughs> justice, and public safety. And yet, that is still not all. <laughs> After the 2014 killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, working with NPR station WESA here in Pittsburgh, Professor Harris created a new show designed to be a weekly conversation about problems with the criminal justice system. And the Criminal Injustice Podcast was born. I told you I'd advertise it. Okay. <laughs> The show is for general audiences and explores the many pressing issues in the criminal justice system. Now in its fifth season, Criminal Injustice includes more than 80 full episodes and numerous other seg segments. It reaches tens of thousands of listeners every month in every state and around the world. Professor Harris is also an award-winning and highly sought after teacher. He's a recipient of the law school's Robert T. Harper Excellence in Teaching Award, which is bestowed each year by our graduating class. In his own words, he is first and last and always a teacher, with an unshakable commitment to our collective mission of educating future lawyers. And yet we're still not done. <laughs> Professor Harris is also deeply engaged in the life and governance of the law school whether it is mentoring junior faculty or serving on important committees, collaborating with colleagues across the university, or participating in orientation and student events, Professor Harris always stands ready to devote his time and talent to advancing the law school. 
One recent example is his extraordinary efforts as chair of our working group on diversity, inclusion, and learning environment, a very significant and ongoing in undertaking that has already yielded substantial progress and for which I and former Dean Carter express our very deepest appreciation. Moreover, in a time of increased polarization and divisiveness, Professor Harris consistently approaches difficult issue issues with an open mind and serves as a role model for us all by his ability to always engage others with mutual respect, even when, and indeed especially when, disagreeing about issues. An endowed chair is the highest honor that a university can bestow upon a faculty member, and one that Professor Harris richly deserved. As evidenced by the comments of his colleagues here, and elsewhere in connection with this nomination, I offer just a few examples. In one review, acknowledging Professor Harris's knack for being out ahead of the pack, David Harris is unquestionably the leading scholar on racial profiling. He is almost singly responsible for bringing this issue to the attention of other scholars, lawmakers, and the general public. Another reviewer said his reputation is based on decades of work at the highest level, sustained across different topics, targeting different audiences he would be an ideal choice for an endowed chair. To these, I must add one more. When he heard this event was happening, our mutual friend, David, Daniel S. Medwed, the University Distinguished Professor of Law and Criminal Justice at Northeastern School of Law, he reached out to offer the following tribute to Professor Harris. David Harris is a gentleman and a scholar. His well-conceived and well-executed research represents a major contribution to our understanding of constitutional criminal procedure, among other things, and his advice and guidance has aided scores of colleagues over the years. You, strike that, yins, are lucky to have him. Incredibly lucky indeed. Professor Harris, you are a rock star teacher, a caring mentor, and a dedicated and highly valued colleague who always answers the call to help, no matter how big or small. You have made incredible contributions across the board in your lifelong effort to promote justice. You inspire us, all of us, to be better. Thank you for all you do for Pitt Law, for the community, and for the world. We are truly grateful. And now it is my great pleasure to proudly introduce our colleague, Professor David A. Harris. Well, gosh, thanks. Oh my gosh. Are you sure that was for me? How are we there? Good? Uh, it is... Uh, such uh, a delight and an honor. Thank you so much, uh, Amy, and thank you so much, Chancellor Gallagher, Provost Cudd. Uh, I, uh, I would like to dedicate my remarks today to uh, my parents, Reuben and uh, Mary of blessed memory, and all of the teachers and mentors I've been privileged to have over so many years. Uh, I'm grateful to all of you. Uh, such a wonderful thing. There's just nothing better that could happen to you as an academic than what is happening up here right now to me. I am just thrilled um, to be the, uh, uh, the recipient of this chair and to be giving this, this lecture. Uh, and I'm very honored to be part of Pitt's large community of scholars and teachers and students and staff and to be a member of this very, very accomplished law faculty. That's what got me here. I mean, I look at this group of people and I say, I want to be one of them. I want to be with them. Um, I want to give special thanks to a few people who are here. Former Dean Dave Herring, are you here somewhere? Yes, I know you are, who spearheaded the initial effort to get me here as a visiting professor back in 2004. I thank you. Uh, 
Former Dean Mary Crossley, where are you? You are here, yes, who, uh, who did the, uh, the work of getting me here permanently, where I was able to start in 2008, and former Dean and now Professor uh, Chip Carter, who nominated me for this position, and all of the, uh, still anonymous to me, senior faculty who uh, uh, endorsed and, and counseled him on his choice. And then uh, especially uh, Sue Leroy who has uh, steered the ship in so many ways, who makes, has made, and will continue to make everything work at the law school. We all know this. Join me in saying thank you to all of them. I'm so grateful to, uh, you, uh, to all of you for your presence here today. Uh, this really means a lot to me. Pitt Law, University of Pittsburgh, and the city of Pittsburgh have been very, very good to me, have been uh, an ideal place for me to do my work and to do the things that I want to do in terms of research and writing and so on. But more than that, to be involved in our community, to step out of the usual academic roles and to uh, participate in civic life, uh, uh, both as credentialed by uh, my work, my research, my position at Pitt, but as a citizen too. And I know that the university and the law school have always encouraged that and want that to happen. And it's just been the greatest combination of place and support uh, that I could possibly have wished for. I have gotten to work with the police department. I see many uh, members of law enforcement here in the audience. I want to thank you for being here. Uh, with the prosecutor's offices, both federal and state, with the public defender's offices, uh, all of it has been very, very good. There seems to be something you want to adjust. Good now? Is that a little better? Okay, very good. Uh, it's been very, very good. With uh, That kind of work is what makes uh, it all worthwhile to me, to bring together the work of research and writing and classroom and community. To join those is the real privilege. And I have just been luckier than anybody I can think of. And it was in that context of bringing those things together really, that this story I'm about to tell you occurred. Right? So uh, this begins for me in about 2008, 09. I'm still in my first year or 18 months here at Pitt. And uh, we had some uh, uh, terrible incidents in one of those years involving the use of tasers. One person died, another was seriously injured. There was a lot of public controversy. And uh, uh, I do what I sometimes do, which is to uh, get my opinion in the newspaper. I wrote an op-ed piece. If David Tribman's here, I thank you. Um, and it was about the proper use and policy for taser use. Our district attorney saw that piece and a few days later asked me to join a task force that he had put together, which I did. Um, now here's the thing, when you do anything with tasers uh, in the United States, you do any kind, of, any kind of a committee, anything like that, you know who shows up? Taser International. All right. That company had its representatives at our meetings, public. They wanted to be in the private sessions. They wanted to give us information. They wanted to do tests in front of us. They were everywhere. All right. Some of that was really good. Some of it, mm, not so much. Uh, but I do remember one day we had had a public hearing in the city council chambers. And the hearing was over. And the taser people were there like usual. And one of them had a big old sample case. And uh, he says, hey, let me show you something. And he opens a sample case and he takes out this little thing, smaller than this remote, right? Um, and he takes his phone and he hooks them together with a wire and he shows me this, if I can make it work. Ah, these little cameras, they fit on ears, they fit on a, like a safety glasses. Uh, you can see how long ago this is because the wire's there. There's no Bluetooth there that, that, that's doing it. And I thought, wow, can I try that? He said, sure, go ahead. I, I looked around, I could see, wow, fantastic pictures just from this little camera. He said, well, we're working on making them smaller. I said, smaller, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Right? And pretty, you know, I, I looked at this, I thought, this could really make some things new and ch change some things in a big way. Uh, this may be 
a kind of breakthrough we've been waiting for in policing because uh, there has always been a, a question of accountability. There's always been a question of transparency in the relationship between police and members of the public they serve. And the public has often been dissatisfied with the degree of transparency that they have gotten. And this my immediate thought was this could be the engine of accountability and transparency in the future. And I let, he let me play with it a little bit. I went, you know, immediately I did what a good little professor does. I run back, I start, you know, looking for other research and so on. I discover, no big surprise, the UK is way ahead of us. They've been doing this for six or eight years already. There's a home office study, there are some pilot studies, and I get into the what literature there was, and I was really kind of taken with this whole idea. And so I do what I do, and you know, there's my law review article from 2010 published in the Texas Tech Law Review Symposium issue on criminal law, and I thought, wow, it's out there. I was the first one, I got ahead of it. And uh, you, you can't really see the title here, I'll read it to you. Picture this, body-worn video devices and head cams as tools for ensuring Fourth Amendment compliance by police. I thought, this! This is it. Well, here's what followed my article. Nothing. <laughs> Silence. Well, you know, I got nice pats on the back from my peers. Wow, you look at this. This is great. You know, I, you know, the the appropriate nice boy things were said, but pretty much quiet until this. All right? 2014, the incident in Ferguson, Missouri. You can see the images here. I'm sure you're familiar with them. Uh, Michael Brown dies after being shot by a police officer and it's followed by weeks and weeks of civic unrest in that area. Um, and almost overnight there was intense interest in this thing called body cameras. All of a sudden they seem to be the talked about option or one of them anyway. Uh, I want to introduce you here to Carlos Jimenez. He was the mayor of Miami-Dade then. This is 30 seconds or a minute of his discussion on a radio program. And this is very typical, right? He's, he's the same as lots of mayors, a whole bunch of police chiefs, all kinds of civil servants. They're all, all of a sudden, very open to the idea of body cameras. Let's see if we can make our audio work here. The ultimate solution to me... We turn it up, we need to turn it up. Everything is actually uh, you. You know, cameras on, on the police officers. I think that um, the, you know, the, the major source of irritation is that there's differences of, of the story between a police officer and, and either a victim or witnesses of the victim. Uh, and then I, I want to make sure that every police officer in Miami-Dade County who's on the streets of Miami-Dade County is wearing a body cam so that you know, everybody can see exactly what happened, who did what, uh, and, uh, and I think that that would quell a lot of the disturbances uh, and a lot of the, the acrimony that is now you know, uh, perpetuating in, you know, in, in our country. Well, how so the stampede begins, and I don't think that's... I don't think that's too strong. All of a sudden, everybody, every police department, everybody everywhere wants body cameras. Here's President Obama with his presidential task force on 21st century policing uh, announcing $75 million for body cameras, up to 50,000 units on a 50-50 split with state and local governments. It was coming. Here it was. Um, and, uh, you know, let's just say there were a lot of requests for copies of that article all of a sudden. Um, and so, the question is, will body cameras usher in a new era of accountability and transparency? That was the question actually in 2014. Now, four years later, the question is, have they done that? What has happened? We're actually in a position where we can look back and see what's happened with that technology, see just how, how they have done uh, in getting accountability and transparency to be part of what we have often wanted, we as members of the public. Okay? So, there are three major issues 
that fall together, but we should separate for purposes of understanding what these cameras are and how they work and what the promise is and what they've actually done. Number one, we should actually ask what body-worn cameras do and can't do right because one thing about a stampede to a solution in the country one time one thing about a stampede toward a technical solution is a lot of times people overlook details right and they forget that technology can't solve every problem but this is something we should know and we're in a position to know a lot more now second uh, let's talk policy Right? We're in the public policy school, I think, in this building anyway. Uh, what has to be recorded and what happens if it's not? There are a lot of policy issues vis-a-vis -vis the use of body cameras. Uh, this, I think, is the core issue. Uh, and I've, had, I've been lucky to have the experience of sitting on the Pittsburgh internal task force for the police department, their, their uh, policy drafting uh, uh, um, uh, group and uh, was uh, part of the group that helped put it together and have some interesting things to show you there and then back to that real question transparency and accountability and that turns out to be about the release of the footage what happens there all right so I'll take you through all three of these issues and we'll see where we end up okay so what can body cameras actually do what can they do? Well, they can do some pretty good things, it turns out. Number one, right? Uh, these are some images from the case of the shooting of Laquan McDonald in Chicago uh, a few years ago. Um, what they can do, and this, by the way, wasn't from a body camera. It was from a dash cam. But same rules apply, I'd have to say. It can, body-worn video can put pieces of the narrative um, beyond dispute. All right? Important. It can. All right? We'll see why it can, but won't necessarily always. And pieces, because we know it doesn't always grab the whole story. But it can put pieces of the narrative beyond dispute. And this is a big change, because in the world of policing and how they interface with, uh, with citizens, especially when there's been a critical incident, the narrative has always been owned by the police. I don't think I'm telling any secrets when I say that. It's always been the police story. This has changed to some degree. And with the shooting of Laquan McDonald, you really see it. All right? uh, those of you who don't know this story, these three images joined together. Uh, police officer Jason Van Dyke rolls up, and within six seconds, uh, he shoots uh, Laquan McDonald, who ends up deceased on the street. When, uh, when the police officer made his report, he said that Mr. McDonald was lunging at him with a knife, was challenging him, was directly in his face. Uh, he had to shoot. And then when the three officers who were also there, you can see them in the background, when they made their report, they said what he said, exactly what he said, right? And that's how it would have gone, except that rumors began to circulate that there was video. It took 15 months for lawyers to pry that out of the police department and the state's attorney's office. But when it came out, it became obvious that the narrative on one side didn't resemble what had actually happened. The net result, you may be aware of, just a couple of weeks ago, police officer Van Dyke uh, convicted of second degree murder in Chicago. Uh, and he testified to what was in his police report. It simply did not match the video. So the narrative change, I think, is a big deal. The other thing we know that it does, and this knowledge is pretty early, it's less robust in certain ways, is that we know that there is a civilizing effect, in, and, it, and it works on both sides of the lens. All right? There are some early studies, the work is still continuing, that show that when you have a camera and the members of the public are aware of it, when the officer's wearing a camera, uh, there is an effect on the behavior of people on both sides of the camera. In one year in Rialto, California, where one of the first studies was done, uh, use of force dropped by 60%. I said six, zero, right? And complaints against the police dropped almost 90%. That, that is really remarkable. I mean, if you, if you came forward and you said, I've got something that will change use of force by 10%, people would be, wow, what is it? 60%. Now, there are reasons that this study has limitations. It's a smaller police department, Rialto is, and there were some other changes going on there. We can get into the weeds if you want and a little later uh, when we get to Q&A. But these results are being shown in some other larger studies too. 
Like I said, it's early days, but there does seem to be evidence of that. Okay, so that's some of what they can do. It's worth looking at their technological capabilities too. We really have to have at least a basic understanding of what cameras can do. So what I'd like to show you is a video that was made by my good friend and colleague at the University of South Carolina, Professor Seth Stoughton. Uh, Seth's a really uh, interesting, bright guy. He's also a former police officer. And he made these videos. They are posted on the New York Times website. I use them by his permission. And so I'd like to show you one. It's going to give you the little TV screen movie thing, 54321. That's going to show you about five seconds of video from a police body camera, from a camera in the middle of the man of the of the wearer's chest. Okay, from that position. Let's see if we can make this work. Alright, ready? Here we go. Okay? That's it. That's very short, right? But you see the action there. You see how dynamic that is. You see all the movement. There's the fist, right? Um, this is uh, uh, a sample of what, you know, what a real camera could get. It's not entirely clear, is it? All right? But it's something. At least it shows you something. All right. Now, next screen, I'm going to show you um, Another, this one will run about 30 seconds. It will first show you that exact same piece of video. Then it will show you video of the very same incident taken from a stationary camera about 20 yards away, I think. Okay, so everybody know what they're seeing? So first it's the same video and then same incident, different stationary camera. You ready? Okay, now comes from the other camera. You get the idea. Right? I didn't pick the music. He did. Uh, but it's really hard to tell what you're looking at sometimes. I think that's the point. And there are limitations on what these things can do. They don't catch every angle. They don't only provide part of the action. And the picture sometimes may, may be distorted. Okay? So uh, we can't take these things to the bank every time. They're not flawless. It's not like watching a movie. All right? uh, and then there are some things that it's very important to understand cameras just don't do. All right? Uh, and this here, we'll, 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 this, we are a law school after all. I've got to talk a little bit about some law here. So, so here's the first thing. Cameras do not change the fundamental legal standard that applies. The objectively reasonable offer, officer standard of the case called Graham versus Connor. This is the baseline law that applies in every case in which force is used and there is a contention that it was excessive. Right? And I really think uh, it would be good if we could know a little bit about what this law is. All right? So first thing, police use of force at any level is governed by the Fourth Amendment. That's the no unreasonable searches and seizures amendment. Right? You could think of use of force as just another way to seize. And of course, deadly force is the ultimate kind of seizure. Right? So it's under the Fourth Amendment. Here's what the Supreme Court says about it. I, I hope you'll allow me a couple of quotes here. All right? The reasonableness inquiry in an excessive force case is an objective one. The question is whether the officer's actions are objectively reasonable in light of the facts and circumstances confronting them without regard to the underlying intent of, or, or, or motivation of the officers. An officer's evil intentions will not make a Fourth Amendment violation out of an objectively reasonable use of force. So in other words, uh, we ask how would a reasonable officer act? Not this one in this situation, uh, even if we know something about the officer's motivations that we really don't like. Those things are disregarded. Instead, we look at what the reasonable officer would do. Second thing to know, the reasonableness, says the Supreme Court, of particular use of force must be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene, rather than with the 2020 hindsight 2020 vision of hindsight, excuse me. In other words, 
you look at this through the eyes of the police officer. No second guessing, no Monday morning quarterbacking through the eyes of lawyers, judges, scholars, anybody. It's the police officer's point of view that counts. And then the court tells us, be careful about this. The calculus of reasonableness must embody an allowance for the fact that police officers are often forced to make split-second judgments in circumstances that are tense, uncertain, and evolving about the amount of force that is necessary in a particular situation. In other words, you look at the evidence from the point of view of the police officer, just remember, the court tells us, how difficult and dangerous that job can be. Now, I think it's a fair statement to say that that piece of law, Graham versus Connor, favors the police. You may think that that is good and totally justified. You may not agree with it, but that is the fact. It favors the police. It is a law enforcement favorable standard. And cameras don't change that. Right? People don't understand that just having more evidence, it can be helpful. It could put some of the narrative beyond dispute. Right? But it does not change the legal fundamentals. That is still the environment in which any case gets tried on this set of issues. Second thing that doesn't change, it does not change the reluctance of some district attorneys to charge police officers. Right? Again, I'm not telling any secrets here. I think it's well known that there are places in which you could not get a district attorney to charge a police officer with a use of force crime. It's not true here. We have one pending right now, don't we? Right? Everybody knows about it. Uh, but it's true in many places. It's true in many places. Work hand in glove with police. Talk to prosecutors as I do very often and I work with them. Uh, they consider themselves part of the law enforcement team. They need the police to be their witnesses. They're reluctant to do that. And besides, these are very difficult cases to win. Very difficult, even with good evidence, even with cameras, even with videos, right? And that really is my next point. The cameras don't change the fundamental reluctance of us, of jurors, to convict, right? Juries are still unwilling to do this. Example is if you needed one, remember this, right? This is the, the cell phone video, not body cam video, of Walter Scott in North Charleston, South Carolina. He is running away from a police officer after a traffic stop. Right? And the officer is in the shooting position, he shoots eight times and he kills Walter Scott. Right? Um, this would have gone unremarked, the officer would have been on the street the next day but for this cell phone video. What happened in this case when it was finally tried to a jury? Nothing. Hung jury. With that. With that. Now, there, you know, there are explanations. The camera didn't show everything, it was turned on later, maybe he did this, maybe he did that. So. The video itself is not proof positive, but my God, it's pretty good. I mean, if you watch the whole thing, you know that there's, I didn't meet a single one of my law enforcement officer contacts or friends who was willing to say a good thing about that, what that police officer did. Pretty much unanimous. I didn't hear anybody standing up for him. And a hung jury. How about this? Sam DuBose in Cincinnati, University of Cincinnati police officer, pulled Sam over. Uh, uh, Sam's car rolls forward a little. Within seconds, the officer shot into his car, killing him. The Cincinnati uh, prosecutor, Hamilton County, I think his name is Joe Dieters. Is that the name of the prosecutor? He's a tough guy. He is a, he is a law guy. He is a prosecutor guy. And he comes out and he says, this is the worst atrocity I've ever seen. I'm going to prosecute this if, if, you know, till my last day. Result, two hung juries, even with the film. And it's out there, you can see it. I mean, it is appalling beyond belief. So the reluctance is still there, maybe reinforced or even created, depending on how you want to look at it, by the Graham versus Connor standard. Cameras don't change this, right? So to the extent we thought that the world would change, I think maybe we were expecting too much. Second area to explore with you, policy, right? Policy seems dry, counts for everything, right? In law enforcement, policy, training, supervision, accountability. These are the four fingers on the hand. I see some of my law enforcement friends nodding right over there, right? 
You gotta have good, well thought out policy all the way there so that officers know what's expected of them. You train them to those policies so that they know what to do. You supervise them. The sergeants, lieutenants are the backbone of any police department and they supervise those underneath them to know that they are adhering to policy and if they don't, there should be accountability. But nothing goes without policy. All right? Now I told you I had the privilege of working with Pittsburgh's uh, uh, police department group to draft our department policy. And it was a real interesting experience, let me tell you. Um, uh, I was one of two people in the room without uniform, badge, and gun. The other was the lawyer for the FOP. Right? So it was, it was good. I can tell you plenty of other things. Um, to me, the core policy question with cameras is when they get turned on. When they get turned on. When they must be turned on. And if they're not turned on, what happens? What happens? Okay? There are lots of other policy questions we could discuss, but this, to me, is, is the central one. Um, I've been working in this space for a long time. By the time I got to working with Pittsburgh and some other police departments, uh, I had come to the, to the conclusion that the best sort of system was three-tiered, right? Must, may, may not, okay? Uh, for purposes of discussing and deciding when the camera has to be in use. Must, may, may not. So don't try to read it all. I'll tell you about it, all right? You must turn it on, officers, when? And it's things like you're arresting somebody, you're giving a summons, you're on a foot chase, you're doing a traffic stop, you're approaching somebody for a stop and frisk. All these kind of things, they are musts. The camera must go on. It has to record. May, all right? Uh, this is discretionary, so um, it could be uh, interviews with crime victims, witnesses, persons who just approach you with information. Yeah, it's up to you. It's sort of up to them, too. And then must not, basically more private things, all right? No recording in the police locker room, no recording in lavatories, no recording private conversations while you're driving around in the patrol car, things like that, all right? Um, I'm pleased to say Pittsburgh really has more or less adopted this uh, on the must uh, uh, grid. Uh, there's actually more there than I thought we would, we would be listing. It's pretty comprehensive. Uh, they do may in a different way than I would have, but that's the idea, right? You give police officers rules so they can follow them and you train to those rules, all right? Now, so, if this is a must situation and the officer does not record, what then? What happens? Right? Because we all know, any of us who've had kids, if you have rules and they get broken and you do nothing, what kind of rule is that? I, I don't in any way mean to compare police officers to children. That was stupid of me. But what I'm saying is if you're in a supervisory position and there are rules and when they're broken there are no consequences, you might as well not have any rule at all. By the way, lots of police departments have some kind of must turn on rule. It's not always three tiers. It's an off and an on, it's this and that. But quite a few of them just leave it to the discretion of the officer. And I, would, I would tell you that's no rule at all either. Right? That does nothing. That will come out one way and one way only. All right? So what happens when an officer doesn't turn it on. Well, you could envision at least three possibilities. Uh, you would have a rule that would say you have to explain in your report that you didn't turn it on and why. What was that for? What, what, what happened? Right? Um, you could be the subject of review or discipline for failing to follow the rule. And then if you want to look outside the police department, it's easy to conceive of using a jury instruction on this subject. In situations in which the police officer did not turn on the camera when they should have, and what happened in that moment becomes a subject of dispute, be it civil or criminal. If the evidence is not there because the camera was not turned on, well, the judge could instruct the jury, you should should infer that the video were it there would favor one side versus the other, right? This was a suggestion I made in my original article. Nobody's taken me up on it yet, but time is moving on. Yeah. All right. So this is what could happen, right? Here's what does happen. Right? I'm going to give you some examples. All right. Well, first, 
I just wanted to show you Pittsburgh's language. Failure to adhere to this policy may result in disciplinary action. All right, so you can be disciplined, but, and, and without reference to Pittsburgh, here's what does happen. Right, some examples. Basically, we have lots of incidents in which cameras are not turned on and there are no consequences. Item. In Minneapolis, uh, the lady who uh, hears some screaming in the alley, somebody's being sexually assaulted, her name is Justine Diamond. She summons the police, one of the police officers ends up killing her. Her, the person who called the police, both officers wearing body cameras, not turned on. No consequences, no discipline. Chicago, body cams off during the shooting of 18-year-old Paul O'Neill in July of 17. No discipline or consequences. Houston, body cam footage begins 49 seconds after shots fired, killing the gentleman named Alva Raziel on July 9, 2016. No discipline. Sacramento, remember Stefan Clark killed in his in the, the grandmother's backyard. Police officers were wearing cameras. You can watch that video, but then right after it, mute, mute, mute. They turn off the sound. No discipline. And another one. I mean, there are so many examples that are like this across the country. This is very disturbing. This shows that something is wrong. Right? Maybe not in any individual case. There may be perfectly good reasons that the cameras weren't turned on, but this is clearly the trend. It is not to impose any kind of discipline at all. And nobody's saying people should be fired necessarily or sued, but something. Right? If you have a rule with no consequences, you have no rule. All right. Transparency and accountability, our last stop here. Now, if you want to know whether cameras are going to contribute to transparency and accountability, I would submit it is all first and last going to be about whether the public can see the footage. If the footage is not public, you don't have what was anticipated. What Mayor Carlos Jimenez said when he talked about, you know, this is a good solution, we'll all know what happened, right? That's what he wanted, that's what everybody wanted, right? Um, and if you look at what's happening now, you could really have the feeling that that's where we are. Right? Because there are, you know, if you've been following this issue, say in the last year, Chicago, in the wake of the Laquan McDonald killing and cover up, really a catastrophe for the city, they changed their rules, release recordings within 90 days. Los Angeles, without a catastrophe, uh, they, they release all video of critical incidents uh, like shootings automatically becomes public after 45 days. And there are a number of large city departments that have done this in the last year. Some, right? But I have a different message, right? From where I sit, when I look at the national picture, this isn't where it's going, despite the news stories and the coverage that these kinds of leading departments might get. Number one, not all the leading departments are there. Look at New York. They're not releasing this. They're, it's being fought there tooth and nail, not only by the department, but by the union, right? Um, but really, there's something else happening. There's a very strong counter trend that has taken hold, and it has eclipsed the purposes that we thought we would have cameras for, which was transparency and accountability. Let me explain why, where I see this and how, all right? Uh, and I'm going to do that using the example of our very own Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. All right. So go back to, I don't know, when we first started to meet down at the police department, maybe 2015, 14, something like that. Um, there was a lot of interest across the whole state in deploying body cameras. Everybody wanted to do it. I mean, just like, just like the mayor said. And that was true here, too. The, the department was in favor of it. Chief McClay was here. Um, everybody thought it was a good idea. All right? uh, and same thing with police departments across the state, Philadelphia, Reading, uh, lots of places that we were hearing about. And so we drafted up our policy. We were pretty far along. We, you know, we had things going pretty good. Uh, but there was a problem. And every department in the state had the same problem. We had in Pennsylvania a very old wiretapping law. This goes back some decades. To, just to explain how old it is, it's only about audio. It has nothing to do with any video at all. Uh, under Pennsylvania law, uh, the law said that if you recorded audio in a home without either permission or a warrant, it was a felony. Right? 
Now that made sense back in 1965 and 70 and so forth. Um, you remember, uh, if you were around back then, you may remember how, you know, the, the sort of fear of wiretapping as a surveillance idea. What, what an idyllic world that was, right? <laughs> um, uh, but that was the law. And so you would not be able to get police departments to agree to do this because police have to run into homes. Police get called to domestic violence calls. We really want the camera rolling. And they would have to either pause and turn it off or go in and ask permission. Uh, it wouldn't work for them on any number of levels. We got DAs from across the state, including right here, just you know, kind of say to them, we're not going to prosecute you. And the uh, police were like, no, that's not enough. <laughs> we're, no comfort there for us. Uh, change the law. Pittsburgh really wanted to do this. They deployed them on their bicycle officers and their motorcycle officers, about 50 officers, because they were the least likely people to end up running into homes. But nobody else. Right? It was just at a dead standstill. And so the idea was, well, I guess we've got to go to the legislature to get them to change the law. And if you remember 2014, 2015 in our legislature, you think back that far? State budgets, nine months late, you know, all kinds of fighting and grabbing and everything. You know, it's the legislature. But it didn't make anybody feel very optimistic, including me seemed very unlikely. But lo and behold, look, they did it, right? The PA body camera bill of 2017, it took them a couple of years, but they did it. They did it, they passed a law to fix a problem. Can you imagine that? <laughs> any problem, any problem, right? So they did it, they really did it, and it fixes that problem, again, don't try to read this, uh, it's kind of boring, but that language at the bottom of the screen fixes the wiretapping problem. So that's not a problem. If, if somebody runs into a house with a, a running body camera, which is recording, of course, not just video, but audio, uh, they are no longer subject to criminal penalties for doing that as long as they're you know, identified as a police officer and engaged in police business. Fixed the problem. Great. Except, oh yes, like Amy said before, there's more. Yes, there's more. Uh, so uh, here's what happened. A funny thing happened on the way through the legislature. I guess that's the name of a play, isn't it? Something like that. Um, let me introduce you to somebody else. I imagine a few people in here know who this is. This is Representative Dom Costa, outgoing. He's going to be uh, going out of office pretty soon. Uh, if you went back a couple of slides here, you would see a teeny tiny little print. He's one of the sponsors. All right, uh, Dom is former Pittsburgh police, former chief of Pittsburgh police before he went to the legislature. And uh, you know, he was one of the people most involved in passing this law. And you know, while they're in the course of fixing that problem I talked about, they got to thinking about body cameras more generally and what they were for and what they're about and what they're supposed to do. And I just want to give you a little bit of Dom's own thoughts. This audio comes from uh, a, uh, a, a session at uh, Duquesne in the Cyril Wecht Institute for Forensic Science and Law. Uh, I thank my friend and colleague uh, Ben Wecht for allowing me to use the audio. If it doesn't work, it's his fault. With the body cams, I think they're great at... Turn it up, could you please? Walks ...that law enforcement has. But I think that... My opinion is I don't want to lose sight of why we were implementing body cams. It's not to, to look at the conduct of the officer. It is to make our criminal cases better, more provable. Because I know when I was in the arson squad, every statement I got was taped. In every case that I took in front of the DA's office and into court was a conviction because those tapes were there. They, documented exactly what I've done, that I followed procedure, I followed the law, and I built a good case. So I think these body, with the body cams, I think they're a great added addition to the toolbox I'm that sorry. law enforcement has. But I think that my opinion is I don't want to lose sight of why we were implementing body cams. It's not to, to look at the conduct of the officer. It is to make our criminal cases better, more provable. Because I know when I was in the arson squad, 
every statement I got was taped. In every case that I took in front of the DA's office and into court was a conviction because those tapes were there. They documented exactly what I've done, that I followed procedure, I followed the law, and I built a good case. So I think these body cameras are a great addition to the criminal justice system so that we, as law enforcement, can convict people and there takes away the element of he say, she say. Okay, what are body cameras? What are they for? Collecting evidence, protecting the cases and the police officers. Dom, transparency, accountability, no. Not part of it, not part of it, not his opinion. And guess what? As we got the brand new law and we started to read through it, oh. It turns out there was more than just fixing the wiretap thing. In addition, what this new bill did was it took all body camera footage and cut it out of the state's right to know law. Right now, those of you who work with it, you know that that right to know law is no big bargain. If you like transparency, it's not the greatest law ever. Um, it does what it does, but this took these videos out of it being possible to get to them through the right to know law. Instead, they were totally exempt, and if you as a citizen would like to get a body cam video or any part of it, uh, you're going to have a different procedure to go through. All right? An individual who requests an audio recording or video recording made by a law enforcement agency shall, within 60 days of the date, when the recording was made, serve a written request to the individual who's designated as the records officer. All right? Lots of procedures that you have to go through. How is it determined whether you get it? Well, helpfully, the law says, um, information, uh, the, uh, <coughs> pardon me, except as provided if a law enforcement agency determines that an audio recording or video recording contains potential evidence in a criminal case, information pertaining to an investigation or a matter in which a criminal charge has been filed, confidential information or victim information, and redaction won't help, um, then the agency shall deny it. All right? The door is closing. Closed. All right? Shall deny it. If it has anything to do with evidence or investigation or anything else, it's over. All right, don't bother to read that. I just read it to you. All right. So, this leaves us, I think, in a very different place than many people anticipated. And Pennsylvania is not alone. Excuse me, I'm doing this upside down. Here we are. Uh, North Carolina, Texas, Kansas, Illinois, other states. All right. That's why I say I think there's a strong counter trend actually in the other direction. We're not moving toward transparency except in a few bigger places. We're moving away from it and on the basis of state law. And if a state passes a law, even if Pittsburgh wants to do something different, they can't. We know how that works. All right? uh, and that's what happened in North Carolina. So what we're having is less transparency, not more, while there's more evidence to be looked at. What does this all mean? All right? uh, well, here's the Pittsburgh statement from their policy, just in case they want, you know, they would like us to know exactly what they think. Any and all data and recordings collected by the equipment are the exclusive property of the Pittsburgh police and will be considered investigative materials. Hey, that word is right out of the statute. If it's investigative materials, shall deny. All right? Oh, and it's ours. It belongs to the police department. This is not yours, citizens. This is not a public record in any sense of the word. Right? Just so you know where you stand, right? Um, how does the public react? I don't have any reactions to share with you from Pittsburgh. We've been quite, kind of quiet about this because our public policy is not yet public. But uh, I'll give you a few examples from around the country. Uh, instead of making officers more accountable and transparent to the public, body cameras may be making officers and departments more powerful than they were before. Another one, uh, body cameras should be a tool to make law enforcement more transparent and accountable to the communities they serve, but this shameful North Carolina law will, do, will, will make it nearly impossible to achieve those goals. 
All right? Here's from some interchanges in Charlotte, North Carolina after the death of Keith Lamont Scott. Uh, demonstrators uh, saying individually and in groups, let us see for ourselves, we want the tapes. Here's what the police chief says, I never said full transparency. I said transparency and that's in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> nice. Right? How would you feel, right? Um, this uh, particular little statement was recorded during an arrest. A woman is being arrested and she has her cell phone camera rolling. The officer says to her, hey, I got my camera going too. And she says, police cameras ain't real. They're built for you. All right? Now, she doesn't mean they're pretend, but she's got the essence of it right there. Right? This is for you. This isn't for me. All right? I don't care about that. That's why I'm still recording, she says. All right? um, Seattle police union official on why cameras will not be an accountability tool. When I'm wearing the camera, I'm there to film you. All right? There are many other ones that uh, I could give you. All right? So the upshot here, I'm, 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 I'm here to tell you, is not what you may think when you hear about the new policy in Chicago or Los Angeles or Houston or whatever other place. It is that this is now another tool for police surveillance of everyone, but especially communities that have already been under surveillance and particularly communities of color. Right? Surveillance is much more intense there. Police presence is much more intense there, often because people call the police. But it's, this is another level of surveillance. And it, it can't be explained as anything else. All right? It's another tool to bolster one narrative. If we can't see it, then it, it doesn't counter the existing narrative that's out there. It'll only be released, and it can be released, I should say, uh, with the permission of the police department and the district attorney when they decide it's a good idea. Uh, and this just is, you know, if nothing else, it's just a missed opportunity to create more transparency and accountability. And I would just tell you those things are real and they count and they really function on the level of building trust. If things are not transparent, if people are not held accountable when things go wrong, there can be no trust. Trust is eroded. And if you don't have trust, you can't work together. You can't work together. The city gets more dangerous. Right? It's really that direct. So. I don't want to leave everybody hopeless at this nice event. I've actually got some ideas about what we could do. All right? More mistrust. I got that already. All right. So is there anything we can do? Anything at all? Yes. There certainly is. Number one, uh, you have to be more alert, more alert than I was, certainly, to what's happening in your state legislature. This is hard with a place like the Pennsylvania legislature. I realize it. You could join a group that has a lobbyist, perhaps. Right? And there are such groups. I can tell you that the uh, Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association has such a lobbyist. And the FOP, I think, probably has some lobbyists too. Uh, think about how you can keep your eyes open, keep yourself attuned, and make your voice heard. Because once these laws pass, they're incredibly difficult to reverse, even though I put it up there. Number two, you have to insist as citizens that when you have that on-off problem, that the thing was there and not turned on, it has to be a major issue. No, it's not like somebody getting shot. All right? But this has to be something that the city government and the police department understands is really important to people. If we don't stand up and make noise when that happens, nothing is going to come of this. But that's, that's the good thing. If we're willing to make the noise, we can actually get some action here. All right? We say we're not going to stand for this. We want to know. And you've got to keep recording, I'm afraid to say. I'm, you know, these, these uh, body cameras are not going to be the solution that maybe a lot of people hoped. So citizen cell phone video will continue to be a major important source of evidence, as well as stationary surveillance video on buildings and other kinds of things, um, that's going to be where a lot of the counter-narrative will come from. And I know my, my law enforcement friends who are here, boy, they, they're not happy that I'm recommending this, right? They don't like everybody waving their phones around when they try to do something, right? I get that. I really do. But if, if the rules were different for using body cams, it might not need it as much. But clearly we do. Uh, here's, a, here's an incident. 
right? This is, of course, the tragic killing of Antoine Rose here, right here in East Pittsburgh, outside our city. You see him running up the hill in a circle. This was caught on citizen cell phone video. This is not from a body cam or anything else. Right? And this made the difference. When the district attorney, when Mr. Zapala announces the charges, uh, this got played. I mean, this was out there. This was the evidence to a large extent. So you're going to have to keep doing this. We really do. And then, it's time to move first. All right? You've got to get to these things up front. You've got to do them before the technology comes online. If you don't do that, you're constantly going to be looking backwards once the technology is paid for and deployed and you didn't have any chance to, dis to discuss what the rules should be. Right? Um, you don't want to be in a position as we are now with so many types of technologies, of challenging them in court later. How many know what a Stingray device is? Okay, got a few hands. How many know what an ALPR system is? Automatic license plate reader. Right? You know what drones are, right? You know, you put a drone in the sky that continuously can orbit Pittsburgh and, you know, we get pictures of everybody, all that stuff, right? Um, these technologies have all been deployed in various places with no citizen say so. Right? It's time for that to change. Right? This is uh, 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 the broad argument for this sort of thing is made by a guy named Barry Friedman at NYU. Uh, he's written a really good book called Unwarranted uh, Policing Without Permission. It's all about finding ways for citizens to get involved with this stuff and set policy and be involved in that before the technology rolls out, before the decisions are made. And that's where we have to be. There's a, there's a proposal, a device for this that's out, people are talking about, called C-COPS, right? Clever. Citizen Control of Police Surveillance. All right? And these are now under consideration in 20 different jurisdictions, some two states, the rest cities, and they've been passed in nine jurisdictions. There's our tiny map. All right? The blue are ones where it's passed. All right? And this would create some kind of public body that would allow people to have input before something, whether it's body cameras or deploying drones or putting stingrays on the ground or using cell site simulator, uh, those are, I'm sorry, stingrays, uh, using cell site location information, all of that, there could be citizen input up front. Because the thing we know about technology, it's only improving all the time. It's only moving fast, moving ahead, getting smaller, stealthier, stronger, able to do more. So if we don't get on this as citizens, we're constantly going to be left behind. I'd like to hear your questions. Thank you, David, for that great talk. My pleasure. Uh, very provocative. I'm sure there are several questions, so why don't we have a few? Sure. Right here. So how long is the video retained, and exactly who has the right to see it now? We're talking in Pittsburgh. Yes. Um, uh, I have the policy with me. I don't, know, I don't know if I can find this real quick, but it, they put the same rules for retention of the policy uh, that are used for dash cam videos. We've had dash cam here for some time. Uh, who gets to see it is the other question. Very interesting question. Um, there's a lot of controversy, another policy issue, about whether officers should get to see video before they write their reports. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? There's a lot of, lot of talk about this, right? Um, if you don't see it beforehand, you may have an impression in your mind and you may put it in a report and it doesn't match up, right? So police officers want to look at it first. Other people say, no, write down what happened. Because if you're going to do that thing where you want to control the narrative, uh, we're gonna, the pictures are going to tell the story. So there's a, uh, I, uh, I don't remember how that came out, but I'll get you the answer. As far as who can see it, Beyond the officer, him or herself, um, there are, there's an auditing system uh, that handles all the recording and the software and everything else, the storage. Uh, and anytime anybody looks at it, the sergeant, the lieutenant, the officer involved, it has to be A, a person who's allowed to do that under the policy, and B, it leaves an audit mark. 
and the original recording cannot be reduced or changed or cut. Right? And so you have a complete record of everybody who's touched it, what they did, what they looked at, when they did it, and so forth. By the way, the Taser Company, which I mentioned so long ago, they make the dominant body camera that's out there. It's called the Axon. They, were the, they, they got to market first. They got a huge share of the market. And their business, cameras, tasers, not the big income generators, storage handling the video, the evidence. That's where they're making all their money now. And they know it, believe me. Yes, Robert. David, you can comment on some of the things that I hear from friends of mine who are police, especially in Chicago, which is with the rise of dash cam, body cam, cell phones, and the ability to collect the video and then transfer it back to the police and so forth. Can you comment on that and how that affects the whole dynamic? Oh, it's a great question. So the question is, uh, when you deploy the cameras out there, are the officers uh, engaging in a kind of performance art? Huh? And, and the other side, both sides. Both sides may be doing that. Yes, that is a real issue and a real problem. Um, you know, we see it sometimes when we see uh, uh, an altercation in the videos, and you hear officers uh, saying, I'm in fear, I'm in fear. <laughs> right? Uh, when maybe they wouldn't be, but everybody wants to know. Uh, stop resisting! Stop resisting. There's a lot of that. A lot of that in the recordings. Not to say it's not happening, but it didn't used to be called out. I don't remember ever hearing anything like that. Uh, people uh, may choose to do similar things. So this is going to call for a little more sophistication on behalf of jurors and fact finders. There's just you know, it's, it's our lives now. So much of our lives is recorded that we all have to be more sophisticated about that. As a civilian, is it appropriate to ask a police officer if their body cam is running and if not, to turn it on? Oh, what a great question. Uh, if you're a civilian and you see an officer's got a camera, which might be here on the ear, might be here, could you ask the officer, is your camera running and would you mind turning it on? Yeah. It's perfectly appropriate. In the same way that it's appropriate for an officer to walk up to you or I and say, hi, could I talk to you for a minute? You could say, sure, is your camera on? Uh, would you mind turning it on? I, well, I don't, well, then nothing to say to you. All right, you can do it. You can do it. Is there a rule that requires an officer to turn it on if requested to by a civilian? Well, you saw the rules, right? So it depends on the department and the rules that they have. So if a department's rule is, uh, a casual conversation with a citizen. In, in Pittsburgh, that would be in the May category. They might turn it on, they might not. Right? If I'm a police officer, I kind of want it on. Right? Because I don't want the citizen later saying, hey, blah, 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 you know, uh, filing a complaint against me. And lots of police officers, I've heard many stories like this, the camera clears the police officer of the complaint. This is very common. That's one of the reasons that I, I knew, I knew they would like them once they got their hands on them. Yes, Pat. Uh, is there any sort of statistic about the camera's not working, what the industry says the accuracy of the camera is versus what is being reported within the department saying this isn't working, or so is there any discrepancy between what the mm. accuracy of the, the schematic is you know, saying it is versus what's actually being reported as being called? My, I don't know of any study like that yet. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, I don't know how many of you saw the story the other day in terms of cameras not working. Out in New York, an uh, officer looks down and says, hey, this damn thing's on fire. It blows up. <laughs> New York had 3,000 cameras made by a company called V-View, uh, which was an independent camera maker out of Seattle until Taser bought it right, because they're dominating everything, and it's the very same problem that Samsung phones had. It's the battery. Right? You'd think people might have considered that, but no, New York has recalled 3,000 of them now. But I don't know the answer to your question. I would like to know that very much. Uh, something tells me there's a lot of discussion behind the scenes about how well they're doing to improve the product, uh, if nothing else. In the back, Jazz. Thank you so much for this talk. It was very interesting. Oh, yeah. The incident where uh, the officer <laughs> didn't have all the guns, they arrested this guy. I thought they cut off the camera, the camera was still running, so they went back, tried to get 
try to put it back on and reenact the scenario as if we had not yeah. Oh, if you haven't seen this, you owe it to yourself just for entertainment value, if nothing else. Uh, the, 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 I'm sorry, did you finish your question? No, no, I, was, I was just saying that that was on my mind. The question I have for you is something I've been thinking about uh, for a long time, which is, is the sexual assault statute still valid? Because the Absolutely right. So the, the, the core question is uh, this kind of legislative action, uh, if you look at the map, um, you don't see uh, uh, what you would like to see, perhaps, if what you're worried about is targeting uh, uh, communities of color. Uh, there's Baltimore right there, right? Um, and so, no, actually, that's Washington. It's too small for me to read. Um, so th th it's a great, great question. And there's always anything like this will encounter resistance. And the stronger the politics uh, behind, say, policing on both sides, uh, the more difficult the struggle is going to be. It is, uh, it is not going to be easy. I hope I didn't imply that. Uh, but it is a form that we could adopt and push. Sometimes, even if you don't get the bill passed, other forms of addressing the issue come into being or crop up. There's that possibility. I don't want to be negative, though. I think it can work. And I think it will become much more acceptable as time goes on. Uh, because police departments, I, my sense working with them now for a long, long time is that they are more acceptable of openness of all kinds than you would think. And this is very much contrary to my statement that they're going against transparency, right? Certainly with body cameras, I do believe that's true. But there is more openness, say, on the command level, on the chief level. And you may, we, you know, we may Looking forward in five years, it would be very interesting to see, and I would be hopeful that there would be more traction for something like this. Uh, I just want to say on that Baltimore thing, uh, there's a funny thing about these cameras, right? They're constantly working. They're not always recording. So there's, there's video being picked up in thir all the time, but it's not recorded except when the, when the on switch is hit, the last 30 seconds is captured. That's what happened in Baltimore. Those guys, you know, the no probable cause, everything else. And what you see in their video is 30 silent seconds of them putting the, putting the dope in the bucket. And then now the audio comes on. They're like, hey, look what we found. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get trained, people, <laughs> or you have problems. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. One is kind of rhetorical, the other Scholars who, like Dan Kahan, who talked about that, even if you actually have accurate video evidence, right, the interpretation of that evidence can differ very greatly based on different types of uh, perspectives, different cultural backgrounds. So, so uh, one one rhetorical point, or one thing that I I think that might be lurking here, is the overall conclusion that that to some extent maybe video evidence is really there's a false promise to it. Uh, that, that people ask for it to do far more than it's actually capable of doing, right? And that uh, it may be best to actually proceed or to think about um, ways in which you can uh, supplement or work your way around some of the limitations, basically, of that type of video evidence. Um, but, but the question that I really have is, I guess I'm, I'm kind of playing around with the idea here about how else one could actually access the video Right, um, that is obtained by police, which is uh, maybe the statute itself actually prohibits disclosure on the grounds that it's investigative materials. But in the context of a court proceeding, you would actually be able to have access to that material. So, so is it possible that maybe one incentive might actually be to actually ask law enforcement to actually be even more inclusive and embolden them basically to take more evidence or more video evidence on the grounds that they think that they're accumulating evidence to build their particular cases, but in the context of a court proceeding, right, uh, you would have access to all of that video. 
being sculpted. That's so interesting. Yeah, um, I, I, uh, my reaction off the top is that when the investigation is still going on, uh, it'll be a tooth and nail fight. And, and very little in way of uh, any, any way to try to convince them, I think, would be difficult. Uh, once the case gets to court, things may shift. And there may be much more of an incentive. But that's kind of when the investigation has wound down and now we're in legal proceedings. And as for your first point, you're exactly right. Dan Cahan's work on that, showing, he, he did that with, regarding a video that is actually posted up by the US Supreme Court of a car chase. It's still there, you can see it. And how different people reacted to it differently. So this whole story has been about raised expectations, raised out of proportion, and then a lack of education. And we saw the same thing with tasers. When we finished our work on that commission, I said, let's go out and tell the community what we, what we came up with and why. That never happened. Right? So we, if we want to use technology, we really do have to do an education job along with it. OK, I think that's a good question to end the formal q and I want to invite you, of course, to go to the reception and um, congratulate David once again. Thank and you. And follow this up. So let's. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a great pleasure.